The snow this year is better at Innsbruck. But not at St. Moritz. Ferrara. Bond, James Bond. Luigi. Really, double You can hear loads of our other episodes on iTunes, Spotify and our YouTube channel where we have interviews, special episodes and reviews of all the Bond films. Simply search Really 007 Pod and you should find loads of weird and wonderful content. Remember, you're only president for life. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, as you can see, we're here live in London. Um, not live now, but uh, we have come all the way down from Manchester to meet one of James Bond's favourite allies, Mr. John Marino. And uh, he played Luigi Ferrara in one of our favourite Bond films, For Your Eyes Only. So we can't quite believe this is happening, but it's, it's amazing to see you in real Absolutely. life, John. Well, it's a, it, it's a first time for me too. So yeah. I'm just as excited and nervous as you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I am, I am. Because then all of a sudden think, well, what am I going to say? What have I done in my life? Is anything worth listening to, hearing about? I have no idea. Believe me, John, we've spent an hour with you and there is a lot to hear. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if I could remember it. <laughs> we, we just had a lovely uh, a breakfast brunch with, um, with John and he was telling us some amazing stories yeah. about his life. I mean, I suppose we should start there, John, with your upbringing and amazing about three or four different countries were involved in, in your in yeah, your my, childhood. My, yeah, my, yeah, my father was from the southwest of... Well, he originally was born in Villarreal. The people who follow Liverpool will know where Villarreal is. <laughs> uh, and he, his family immigrated to southwest France when he was eight in 1918, just after the First World War. And he stayed there, became an engineer, and but... He joined the travelling circus and decided he wanted to be, a, 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 first of all, an acrobat, 1935, something like that. And he travelled around um, England and, in fact, came to London in about 1936 with this acrobatic group. But he knew he didn't want to be an acrobat, he wanted to be a juggler, so he started perfecting his skills as a juggler. <laughs> then he was actually touring France and he went to uh, Strasbourg and met my mother, who was whose parents owned a hotel and restaurant. They met, they fell in love, she eloped. He was then in Paris. They eloped and they got married. He then perfected his act. And I think in 1939, Lou Grade contacted him saying, please, will you come to England? I've got some very lucrative jobs for you. And so he, my mother and I, then three months old, came to England, was met by Leslie Grade at Victoria Station and and then literally months later war broke out and they stayed here and became british citizens and wow. that's how it started and i remember as a child standing in the wings and watching wonderful acts like i don't know who were they uh, um vera lynn um, oh. buster keaton um and all those silent movies that came over just after the war and did... Uh, you mentioned Laurel and Hardy Laurel and Hardy, yeah. absolutely, Laurel and Hardy. And all the great stars. They worked with Peter Sellers and Morecambe and Wise and things like that. And uh, and so I, I had a back, uh, upbringing of just watch, standing in the wings and watching these wonderful variety acts. And I, I suppose by osmosis, I learnt things like comedy timing, just seeing just how, how you drop a line in, you know, how, how you... Stop them laughing when they shouldn't laugh and wait for the punchline. I just learned that just by watching how how wonderful the technique they had. And so my parents were working with someone called Lord uh, Bernard Miles, who was an actor, but during the war there was no jobs for actors, so he developed a, a monologue in which he became a Chiltern Hill farmer and he used to come on stage with a great big cartwheel and became a Chiltern Hill farmer and talked about the life in the village and the Chiltern Hills <laughs> and all like that. And, uh, and then he, he well, after the war, he, he then he, he ran the Mermaid Theatre, which was uh, in the city, uh, Puddle Dock. And he asked my parents, um, when my father retired, to, um, to come and be front of house managers. And that's how I got involved in a way. But before that, of course, <laughs> yes, my father used to take my father and mother used to take us on these wonderful exotic um, um, summer holidays to Europe, Italy, Venice, Rome, Copenhagen, south of France. And when I was about 16, 17, I was in a hotel in Nice. My father was working in the casino and I came in 
And there were two gendarmes at the reception and I got my key, went up to my room, the telephone rang. They said, please, will you come down and bring your passport? I came down and the two, two gendarmes said, uh, you're under arrest for draft dodging. And I said, but I'm a, I'm a British citizen. It says here, British citizen. He said, yes, look at the second paragraph. And it says, people of dual nationality will not be protected by Her Majesty's government for such things as military service in their country of origin. And it's quite there on the second paragraph. Oh, wow. So I was uh, put in prison. I was shipped to Marseille. I was court-martialed. I was acquitted uh, and thought, well, that's it. I'm free to go home. <laughs> but no, they said, no, now you're going to be taken to a caserne and you'll do your military service in the French army. This is the late, <laughs> late 50s, uh, the 60s, I suppose, 1960, 1959, 60, during the Algerian war. And I was on guard duty one day outside the barracks and this young German, I knew he was German by his accent, came up to me, tried to speak to me in French in a very, very bad accent. And I said, listen, do you speak English? And he said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm looking for the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Foreign Legion Air Barracks. And I said, oh, it's just around the corner. I said, uh, that's where you have to go. And he was, so he's obviously going to join the Foreign Legion. And when I was there in, in the caserne, the barracks, um, I got a phone call from headquarters saying uh, the British Navy are in port. And normally the French uh, army give a courtesy coach to the ratings and captains to take them around the south of France. And I found that. I went to my captain and I said, listen, can I be co-driver on the coach? Because I can speak English to them, you know. And he said, if you give me your word as an English gentleman not to desert. And I said, of course, of course, I'll give you my word, you know. So we arrived <laughs> on the dock in a, in a, in a, in a single decker, 80 passenger bus. And all the ratings came out, all 80 of them, or 60, what it was. And I stood there in my French uniform. I said, good morning, chaps. I said, you won't believe this, but I'm actually English. And they said, oh, get off. I said, I said yes, I, I, well, I, I didn't, I said, I told them a little story, you know. And this went on for three days. We took them around Avignon and all the nice historical places around the south of France. And on the third day, we arrived in to offload the last ratings. And uh, a lieutenant came down and said, uh, we've just heard your story from the ratings. The captain wants to see you. And it was a big factory ship and two submarines. And so I went to the, 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 the captain's ward, wherever it was, and he said, I've just heard this extraordinary story. Is this true? And I said, yes. He said, look, we sail at midnight. If you want to stay on board, we'll take you out. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry about this, but I give my word oh, yeah, yeah. as an English gentleman not to desert. And he said, I quite understand. OK, well, I mean, amazing story. Anyway, you're quite willing to stay on board and we'll get you out of the country. So I said, no, I've got to go back. So I did go back. And, and, and about 18 months later, I renounced my French nationality and I, I was free oh, to come back. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I forgot to tell you that. In the <laughs> yeah, I didn't know, no. yeah, yeah. And they, crazy. And they, yeah, it's crazy, crazy story, crazy story. But then I, I, before that, when I was a young man, I joined an amateur dramatic group because I really wanted to be, I thought I wanted to be an actor really rather than a juggler. My father was a juggler. And so I, I did join this amateur dramatic group um, for when I was about 14, 13, 14. I really enjoyed it. So my fathers were now, my parents were now um, in the, the Mermaid Theatre in front of house managers. And um, I, I met Bernard Miles. And, um, but I'd always, I joined the, the Central School of Dramatic Art and did a year when Bernard Miles' daughter said, uh, John, I'm, I'm forming a new repertory company. Would you like to join us? So I left the drama school and went to join the Market Stage Company. And I stayed with them for about three years. We toured around Newcastle and Manchester, hey. the, the, <laughs> art, the Arts Theatre in Manchester. And uh, so that's, that was the start of, um, that's the beginning of oh, becoming an wow. actor. Anyway, so I mean, you know, I, so I did. I, I, was, I was doing a television series called The Talisman about the, the Third Crusades. I was playing Philip of France. And it was about um, Richard the Lionheart. Yeah. When I got this call from my agent to go to meet um, Debbie McWilliams, at Eon Production Number Three, of South Audley Street, and I said, "What is it about?" He said, "Well, I, it's it's James Bond." I said, "Oh, is it?" I wasn't. I didn't really <laughs> yeah. think much about it. I thought, "Oh well, all right. I'm doing a BBC. I've been doing this for 13 weeks. So, I mean, I was working." So I went to this place, and there was Debbie, and she said, "Listen, we're in the waiting room. We'll I'll tell you what's going to happen." Um, We'll talk, and then when I get the signal, we'll go, we'll go into the back room where all, everyone is. They'll all be there, but just I'll ask you a question. Just talk to me. 
And that's what I did. And they put in a big chair, I was like a throne. So I sat there <laughs> and Debbie just asked me questions, what I was doing and I was telling them. I said, well, I feel quite comfortable here because I actually spent the last 30 weeks sitting on a throne. So I feel <laughs> quite happy. Um, anyway, um, there was John and Cobby and, and, and uh, his wife. They were all there, but I, because I hadn't got my reading, I hadn't got my, I take my glasses off to do the interview, so I really couldn't see anyone. I was just assuming where they would be. But three days later, I got the call saying, you've got it. Oh, Amazing. You've got the part. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I went to celebrate at Joe Allen's, and I was having dinner with a friend of mine, and I saw a friend of mine on a table not very far away, and I went over to say to her, I said, yeah, she was, um, I'd, I'd just done the Ian McKellen season yes. with him for three years, and she was in the company. And I said, I've just got this one amazing job. I've, and I was speaking to the other person who was sitting with her, and I said, do you know, I've, uh, I've got this job. I'm, I'm doing a Bond film. And, yeah. and she said, uh, she said, I know a job. I'm Debbie. Oh, I'm right. Debbie <laughs> <laughs> I was telling <laughs> Oh, it was so embarrassing. She said, John, I've just, you know, I'm, I cast you. We were talking <laughs> three, three days ago. And I couldn't remember her. But anyway, that's, that's how Brilliant. I got the part. Oh, and then we went for the costume fitting. And after about three or four weeks, I got a call from the costume department saying, John, can you meet in Oxford Circus and uh, we'll get you fitted out? So I assume we, we'd be going down to Knightsbridge, going to Harrods and, you know, and things uh. like that. We walked into the nearest CNA store. <laughs> and that's... That's where my costumes came from. You know, it's CNA. But who, when you, did you get the script before then, or did you know who you were playing? Or I knew, I knew I was playing. Yes, yeah. I did know I was playing, and it was, um, it was a good part. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. bloody good part. I had six scenes I had, six scenes. I mean, not all were shot, but uh, I did have six scenes, and then I thought. Well, it was quite extraordinary being in the Bond film because you, you've just done the BBC and, yeah. you know, you eat out a, a double-decker bus at lunchtime. Yes, time yeah, and yeah, like yeah. That, you know, it's, been on, yeah. You know, you've been on one of those. And then all of a sudden you arrive in Cortina and they give you everything. Oh. You've got a driver, you've got a stand-in, you've got everything's there. You've got incredible food and you're staying in a five-star hotel. Yeah, yeah. You're meeting all the other actors, you know, Lynn Holly Johnson, Charles Dance, John Wyman cameramen were all staying in these amazing hotels and and the car will pick you up john you know uh x time will take you to make up and put you in costumes and you'll do the first scene which is by the by the uh by the ice rink yes so you, yeah so that that's how it started it was that was the first scene we shot was that yeah. that scene it was so bloody cold in <laughs> fact between takes we had to go into the local cafe which was right on the rink, to, 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 to thaw out. Because mm -hmm. it was freezing. The sun yeah. was out, but it was freezing. Everyone was in uh, Arctic clothes, apart from us, the actors. You know, <laughs> Roger was always very stoic, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was lovely. But oh, yeah. He, he had the trick of always telling you dirty jokes before a take. <laughs> you know. To and, put you off? Or did, yeah. I know, I yeah. think it's to relax you. Yes, uh, okay, yeah. You yeah. know, you, used to, you just t started, you hear this one about the Ang Englishman, Irishman, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> And I, I listened, of course, because it's, it's Roger. Yeah, it? yeah. And then punchline came straight, bef straight before action. <laughs> yeah. And of course, by, by then you were laughing, so you cut. <laughs> Roger, can you not do that? Um, you know. <laughs> but, but that's that's genius in itself, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, professional. He, he was wonderful because at one point in that, the very first scene in the film where you first see me and him, yes, we do yeah. that, the bit we've just done. Yeah, yeah. Um, John said, oh, all right, we've done that, uh, we've done that two shot, John. Um, can we do, we'll do a reverse on Roger. And, uh, and, and Roger says, why are you doing a reverse on me? No, give it to John. I mean, I'm in the film all the time. Oh. Give the close up to John. Brilliant. And that's, that's what's so in the film. Good. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, generosity. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was John Glenn's first film, wasn't it? So it was. I know they knew each other, of course. They knew each other, yeah. I think so. But uh, I, you wouldn't have known that it was John's first film, by it, because oh. it, was, it was so in control. Well, he, being an editor, he knew yes. exactly yeah, what he yeah. needed. Yeah. He, he just yeah. needed, he, he only needed what he needed to do the cuts. He knew how much. So it was, you know, it was one take, one take, two takes, one take, two takes. Very, he knew exactly what he wanted. And, and as an observation, John Glenn's films are probably the best at storytelling in the series because the there's not much uh, excess fat on them, you know. Yeah, right? yeah. they flow very they well. Flow they flow very well. Yeah, yeah, and it was, it was, it was. Uh, but I, I do have a story. I'm going to have to stand up. I can oh, God, he's the, no, it, yeah. on, the, on the third day, we shot the, the first scenes. We shot in the ice rink, but the, <clears throat> the second, the third, or fourth day, said John, we're going to do the, um, the the stuff, the stuff where we first meet you. 
So I, he said, the, the, the car will pick you up at eight o'clock. You'll have makeup and costumes. You'll already be in co- uh, makeup and costumes. Just go to the location. They'll drop you off. And I got there and uh, what looked like a, a very small bus terminal. Mm-hmm. And I walked in and I, oh, I didn't see anyone there apart from the second assistant. And I said, where is everybody? He said, well, they're on location. I said, well, isn't this it? He said, no, 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 John, John. We, we're going. He said, come over to the window. I'm going to stand up here. <laughs> come over to the window. And he said, um, you, he said you, you see that mountain up there? I said, yeah. He said, well, across the valley, we're going to go up to that mountain. I said, well, how are we going to get there? He said, are we going to take a car or a bus? He said, no, no, we're going in that. And I looked across what looked like the back end of a small wooden van. And I said, in that? He said, John, that is a cable car. Right. And I'd never seen a cable car. I'd seen them on film. But yeah, I yeah, seen. Yeah. And then I noticed the, the ropes, the, the, the cables going across this huge valley, you know, yeah. straight up this mountain. I said, oh, God, I said, uh, well, and by then Roger arrived. And I said, and a lot of other young skiers had arrived. And I said, I rushed up to Roger. I said, Roger, we're, this is not the location. He said, yeah, I know. I said, this is the location. Said, I said, look, we're going up to the top of that mountain up there. He said, yes, I know, John. I said, and we're going in that. He said, John, I know. I said, Roger, I'm petrified of heights. Ah, right. I'm petrified of heights. He said, well, I feel a bit queasy about that as well, John. I tell you what we'll do. Let me think. Uh, we'll go in before all the young skiers go in and we'll stand in the middle of the cable car. Then we'll let all the young skiers stand around yes. us where we won't be able to see out. And I said, well, I think I'll, I will be able to see out, uh, Roger. He said, well, look, we'll, we'll hug each other, we'll close our eyes, and we'll sing. And I said, sing? What, what shall we sing? He said, we'll sing that Vera Lynn song. We'll meet again, don't know when, don't know when. I said, Roger, isn't that a bit... Uh, I feel a bit funny about singing that song. <laughs> So that's what we did. Yeah. We hugged each other. We had our eyes closed and we sang, we'll meet again. But I mean, luckily there was no smartphones in those days because yes, had they been yeah, smartphones, been. people would have been clicking yeah. and saying, Roger Moore found in a cable car <laughs> yeah. hugging a bloke. Yeah. You'd be a YouTube sensation, John. It would, it would, have, been. It would have been. Singing Vera Lynn. Yeah. Singing Vera Lynn. <laughs> oh. But it was, it was wonderful. We had a wonderful time. And... Uh, and I spent most of my time with, well, Roger would turn up everywhere. We'd go to the nightclubs. He would always oh, be there. Right, he, was, well. he was one of the lads. Oh. Did he was. Had you met him before? Because you, you were on The Persuaders, is that right? I did meet him before, but yeah. I met him even earlier when right. my father was working in Variety in Swansea and he was working on the bill with Dorothy Squires. Oh, yeah. Was he married to her? Yes, yes he was. Or, or either married or engaged. Yes, but, yeah. and, uh, and, and Dorothy came up to my father and said uh, do you think you can give me some physical exercise I want to get him trim my young my young boyfriend's coming tonight and uh, <laughs> and so I, I was at the stage door when at the end of the show when yeah. Dorothy Squires came down and and behind her was this handsome young man and that was oh, Roger wow. I never told him that story I'd actually met Did him when I was know? 14 years old no I never told him so he was in his 20s then probably yes yeah, so I think there was a I'm, I was about 42 and Roger was 50 or something? 50s once a year, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, Yeah, so there was about a... So he was, yes, early 20s. I might have been 14, 15. But that's the first time. And I never (laughs) told him that I'd already met him in in the Persuaders. I never told him that either. It's a funny situation. Funny, funny, funny situation. Yeah, Yeah, so... But it was was lovely. Absolutely lovely. Was the Persuaders before the bomb, though? It probably would have been, wouldn't it? I think it was. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it was. Yes, so it's, it's... so that was my, my experience and, you know, when, and then I realised that it was a huge because everyone mm. knew us in Cortina. They knew we were the, the, yeah. the, the James Bond film was being yeah. done. It took over the place, wasn't it? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. We all had the same kind of apresky yeah. uniforms yeah. on. So everyone knew we were connected with the Ian production. So we were let in everywhere. The nightclubs, the very posh night. It was full of millionaires. Oh, yeah. I mean, the extras... The, if you look at the extras, they're all wearing their own mink clothes. <laughs> yes. They're all wearing. He said, I was speaking to the costume designer. He said, you know, I had this lorry full of, of clothes and all these extras came up and I looked at what they were wearing. I said to my assistant, Put, close the door. That yes. Close the door because what they're wearing is far better than what I've got for them. Yeah. <laughs> See you next. 
absolutely <laughs> whatever whatever but i mean you know it's it's full of millionaires it's full yeah. of people all the big industrials from rome and torino milano and their families came up for that period yes, of time yeah. to to be there mm -hmm. with them <coughs> so it was um extraordinary oh, so there we really, are yeah. so i mean the, the the premiere was some time after i think we went i went up to pinewood for the rap a party a rap party and then i think lynn holly she came to stay with me in, in my house her and her sister uh during that time it wasn't the premiere it must have been when she was actually doing some shorts maybe yes. tie-ups in, yeah. in interiors yeah, yeah. at pinewood so i uh, we, we got became very good friends charles dance john wyman i think i've told you that yeah no you can oh, tell us again yeah yeah, yeah 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 love to we were inseparable inseparable yeah. the four of us it was just it was wonderful i mean it was and then, I mean, you know, I got back to London and the next day I signed on at the Labour Exchange in Brixton. So it was, a, you know, <laughs> yeah, the actor's life different. from being up there down to there. <laughs> and then I, yeah, and the premiere was, I didn't know what to expect. I, I, I went up to Edinburgh to do a play. Then I came down. I don't think I did only Falls and Horses. I think it was after the premiere. And of course... I, I I rang up someone. I said, "Do I have to wear any particular kind of clothes?" And said, "You're <laughs> yeah. going to have to be a tuxedo or something like that, John." So I hired a tuxedo. My wife, well, she was my girlfriend, bought a, an elegant, um, uh, I suppose, gown, and there we were. We parked in Covent Garden. We walked, and there was the red carpet and all these fans. Oh, yes, I couldn't believe it. Oh. It was an and royalty as well. I never met them, but I think yeah. they were there. Maybe yeah. Charles yeah. was there or somebody or Diane. Charles I don't Diane, know. I think, yeah. Yeah, they might yes. have been there, but it was an extraordinary. And then we all went off to this, this party, mm -hmm. this very posh party somewhere in Knightsbridge. Oh, wow. On, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was extraordinary uh, uh, time. I'm presuming uh, the future James Bond, Pierce Brosnan, was there as well, wasn't he? Because of his... Um, yes. With Cassandra Harris. Because he... he I di he didn't come to Cortina. No, right. No, okay. those were in the, the, the more hot scenes, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but would he have been at the premiere, though, with her, possibly? I didn't he see him. Been. Right, okay. Yeah. I didn't see him. I mean, tragically, I didn't see him. Um, but, I mean, I learned later of that tragic event. But, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, it's, uh, it was, it's desperately sad. But that's where I got to. And, and in the last 40 years, I've met Lynn t twice. One at the Pinewood Memorial Service for Roger, yeah, yeah. where I met her again, and then we went to several, we had a couple of meals, we were just up the road here and somewhere else in Sloan Square. But when we were, when we, when she was here doing the, the, the interiors at Pinewood, I did take her to a play at the Royal Court, her and her sister. And it was, in those days, it was a, a kitchen sink drama. Oh, I mean, right, very, yeah. very real and very gritty. <laughs> it's an American watching that, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> There was one scene, it was very, it was, I think it was, uh, took place in Nottingham, the scene, and it was a, you know, and the minor, the, 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 the breadwinner of the house came back from work, opened the door and said, all right, love. And she said, your bath's ready, you know, so. <laughs> and, and he had a bath and took all his clothes off. And his wife, who was about 56, the actress, she took all her clothes off and had a bath. What? And Lynn Holly and her sister shrunk oh, down. <laughs> Tried to hide, hide away oh, from wow. what was happening on the on Did the you stage. not know that was going to happen? Sure. No, no, they no. were so embarrassed. Yeah. Oh. Innocent Americans. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh. Like, like BB, very innocent. Yeah, absolutely. Not at all. But... No, no, I mean, <laughs> she couldn't be, oh my God, my God. <laughs> oh, she was lovely. And she hasn't changed. I mean, I met her yeah. for the second time at, uh, at Roger Moore's Memorial, and she was exactly the same. She looked the same. She was enthusiastic and witty and charming oh. and full of beans and energy. And now she is here. Yeah. Wow. You, you'll be meeting her. I'll you? be yeah, meeting yeah. her on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, yes. Oh. You, are you going to take her to another dirty play then? Yeah. I was going to take her to a play with Mark Rylands called Jerusalem, which is Oh, wonderful. yeah, fabulous, yeah. But they're going to two musicals, so I'm not sure if they've got time. Okay. Oh. They're going to Le Mis and... Uh... Well, when you're in London, I suppose. It's the done thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mary Poppins, I think, is the next one. Oh, yeah, I, lo I, lo I love it. I mean, I t I t you probably can't get a ticket to, to Jerusalem no. with Mark Ryan. I've seen it already. It's yeah. a wonderful play. But anyway, is there anything else? Oh, cool. Oh, to yeah. ask about the character of Luigi himself, if that's possible. Well, I did a lot of research. Did you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do with a character? I mean, I worked it out that this, this man was, was a, a, a work for the Secret Service, but it basically was a pen pusher. 
Yes, that's yeah, how it was. Yeah. He wasn't a man in the field. He wasn't a, a James Bond. He wasn't one carrying guns and things like that. You know, he didn't have all these. He was a pen pusher. He was a bureaucrat. You know, and yeah. he probably would have worked on a computer if it had been today. Yeah, you know, would, all he would have done yeah, yeah. doing all that. You know that. Well, yeah. what you two are good at, but you know, <laughs> going on, the, finding out all the secrets of the opposition and all yes. that. That's what he would have been. So I thought I'm going to play him as that, pretending to be a secret agent in the field. Dressing as he was, totally incognito, when he looked like a sore thumb, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I yeah. mean, that's the reason why they dressed him like that, because everyone they knew would be in après ski, and he walks around as if he's walking around the streets of Roma. Yeah, well, is that where you think he, his background would be? He wouldn't be from Cortina, would he? No, 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 he came up from yes, Rome yeah, in, yeah. into Cortina. I assume that, but I, and that's my motivation for the clothes they've put me in. Mm. But I'd already worked out that he couldn't have been... Yeah. He couldn't have been a man in the field that he was not a Roger Moore. He wasn't an no, a, no. A 007, not at all. Yeah. But he was an information man. And yeah. that's what they wanted. They mm. wanted him to get background on the two villains and things like that, which he, he knew about. Because he did know Christatos, didn't he? And obviously oh, absolutely. he linked to Bond. Yeah, and he refused to shake my hand. Yeah, well, ah, we were going to ask yeah, about that. I was so, at, in the rehearsal, he shook my hand, but on the take, he didn't. Is that is that true? Yeah. So it was in character. Oh, absolutely in character. Oh, and I think it was brilliant. It's brilliant. It's it's brilliant. brilliant. Superb that. Yeah. yeah. Moment. Because uh, it's a bit of a who done it for a Bond film. You don't know who to trust at that point. No, that's point. right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. It's pretty I mean, much the only one actually, really. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Where maybe Electric King, maybe. Maybe Electric King, but the idea that Bond has dinner with the villain yes. without realising that he is the villain. We had more than dinner. We had the, the dinner he has. Yeah. But we also had a scene which was cut where we go to his villa. Oh, and we oh have my word. The big scene in the villa where we have this you know, slap up dinner and uh, Luigi is enjoying his pasta, as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, and making remarks. We have this talk. So, we, yes. Oh, wow. And then, of course, in, in the original script, I at one point, I think I collect him from the ski jump. And then, yes. you know, when he's escaping the bad man. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, Charles Dunst. Charles Dunst. Yeah. And I meet him somewhere and I'm in the Lotus and he gets in and we drive away. And I'm driving the Lotus. And I, I'm, I'm playing around with the buttons. That's why in the scene when I die and he leaves me at the ice rink and he turns around and says, don't touch the buttons. Yeah. Oh. Because it doesn't make sense. But it did, of course. It would have got a good laugh had this scene, yeah, the previous yeah. scene where he actually has pushed buttons. And uh, so... Because uh, you yeah. just see you in the background doing something, ah, like this. Yeah, yeah. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm driving and sort of... Don't! Yeah. <laughs> so you drove a Bond car. And what, it's a beautiful say, car, isn't it? Oh. Well, I never got to drive it, you see, because... Those, oh, because it... Yeah. Because John said, listen, we're running out of time. We've only got three weeks. We've got... And, and some of the special effects and the, and the stunts, you yeah. know, they're so complicated. Uh, we haven't got time to shoot your dialogue scene. Oh. And and the and the and the the chippies and the sparks who had built that Cortina um, chateau uh, dining room, they used to come up to me and say, "We've done a great set for you, John. Yeah. You know, we just finished painting; it looks great." Oh, wow. And then John Glenn rang me up. I was in the hotel. I said, "John, I've got some really bad news for you. We're going to have to cut six of your scenes." Oof. He said, "It's a shame because if we'd have kept them, this might have done some great things for your career." Oh dear, John. <laughs> well, I mean, you did all right. I did all right because I played Jesus Christ after all. Yes, and yeah. I've actually played the devil as well. I mean, I, the, the two extremes. Yeah. Which one did with... you prefer? Well, Christ was. Uh... Can we talk about? Yeah, Christ? Christ? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I went for the audition, and it was given this very complicated 14th century text. 14th century, <laughs> very difficult stuff. This was on the theatre, wasn't it? No, this is for the BBC. Oh, is it BBC? BBC oh, right, Two. Okay. And I thought this text. I thought. I said. <laughs> I, he said, and uh, 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 more complicated than that, John. But we're actually going to do it in um, in the accent of, of of the period. In other words, 14th, 14th century accent, in which, in those days, the language was a mixture of French or Norman French, and Saxon, mm. and so when you came across a French. Norman word like conversation, you would say conversation. And when you came across an Anglo Saxon word like knife or knight, you would say knicht. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Just like the Chaucer, isn't it? Yeah, wow. yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so he said, There we are. So there we are. <laughs> he said, And I got the call a few weeks later, and uh, he said, You've got the part, John. And I said, Oh, wonderful. He said, Will you come up to the um, Alexandra Palace? We have to do a full cast of you. And so I had a whole day where they made a full cast of me, 
front and back, the whole face, all the legs. What? They said, because at one point we are going to see the sword going into your body. Ah, right, the, yeah, the, yeah. Sword, yes, the spear. The spear yeah. So we can't have you do that because, you know, so th- it'll be a, a, a facsimile, you know. Yeah, a long shot. It was never used. Oh. No, <laughs> they cut the scene. I don't know why. Maybe it was too gory. I don't know why. But anyway, we did. We, we came to the scene where I was um, just before the, the nailing of the cross and I was on the floor being nailed by the Roman soldiers and I said... Uh, before we did this, and we never mentioned it before in rehearsal, but I said, I said, called to the director, I said, uh, when the first nail goes in, what do I express? Do I express pain? Yeah. Uh, no pain or violent? Mm. And he said, just a minute, John. He said, we're going to come down. And the director, the producer, and several theologians came down. I was on the cross, and they were having this theological conversation above me yeah and they're saying we can't make up our mind what he feel is he a man is he not a man and so he said we're going to shoot three versions one of you not reacting hardly at all one where you're reacting a little bit and one you actually are in serious pain and you're trying to stop the soldiers from banging in the nail further and uh so okay i've never seen it so i don't know which version they used oh right so but try and track it down for you well, they might be able to. But, I mean, it was in those days the crosses were pre-drilled. Yeah. So they put one nail in, and so you would attach that way. And if you're short or long, they attach ropes to your wrist, and they would yes. heave your arm along till it got to the hole. Then you could bang it in. So quite often they would dislocate in the pulling. There were three Romans or four Romans yeah. pulling you. And they did the same with the legs. They would attach a rope to the waist and pull you down, to your wrist, and then they would nail you. Anyway, Gosh. when we got to the cross... They hoisted me up there. They said, we're going to put you in a parachute harness. So you were in a parachute harness and they attached the harness through the cross and you were attached there. So you're hanging, merely hanging. And uh, the nail heads were glued to your palms. So doing the, the rest, you could just simply put your arms through the, the, yeah. the ropes and then you, you would be hanging on in, in the parachute harness. And uh, this had taken a long time, nearly all morning. So by about 10 to 1, they said, uh, before the, we shot the film, um, they said, John, um, we've got a slight problem. Um, it's lunchtime. And it, it's going to take, to get the, the, the cross down and get you out of the harness, it's going to take 20 minutes. And then we've got to have to put you back on mm-hmm. the cross and put you back in the harness and hang you up. It's going to take another 20 minutes. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave you on the cross. <laughs> So I was left on the cross for the entire hour of lunchtime in an empty studio while they all oh my word. went off and I had lunch. Oh, my word. <laughs> so you were reliving it quite. I was reliving so it. you were, yeah. That's so, yeah, I, was, I, I couldn't eat or drink anything because they couldn't get me off yeah. the cross oh. or do any of those things. So I was, I was really abandoned, really. Oh, and it was, it was quite good in a way because the feeling of being yes. abandoned yes. was yes. quite good because the next speech is when I talk to my father yeah, yeah. and say, please forgive them, you know, yes. I've been abandoned, that feeling of new abandoned. Mind you, none of us could understand what we were saying because the accent was so, you know, mm. yeah. we, we knew what the... <laughs> we, we knew what the, 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 the text was, but when we spoke it, neither of us could understand no. what we were saying because it was so extreme, the pronunciation, the, that, that period pronunciation. But so, yes, there, there we That's are. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so oh, they left me. But it, it worked quite well, because when I did that speech to my father, um, I did actually felt, feel, felt abandoned, because oh. they had abandoned me, and no one came to see me. No. Are you all right, John? <laughs> We'd only be with another half an hour. Are you all right? Only one, the makeup lady, came in and said, John, are you all right? Can I get you anything? Because I'd taken my hands out, and I was just yeah. kind of leaning like yeah. this. <sighs> and then, Oh, my word. Extraordinary experience, yeah. Wow. It's quite a responsibility playing Jesus, though, isn't it? I mean, in general. I think so. Yeah. 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 And not is many it? people get get that part. I know there they? aren't many actors that play Jesus no, Christ. No. Not many. Not I know the BBC all. came to interview me for about 30 years ago about, because I played Christ, they came to interview all the actors that had yeah. played Christ. And when they heard the story being left in the mm. studio on the cross, they said, will you please come up to... Um, to um, the studio and re- recount it to camera. Yeah, come into yeah. the studio and say, this is where it happened and tell us what, what, what happened. Wow. I don't think it was ever transmitted, but it was certainly filmed for the BBC to be put out on Christmas, um, on Easter, yeah, so Easter yeah. Sunday. Mm. No, it wasn't. It was Good Friday. Good Easter Friday, Sunday. yeah, yeah, yeah. The resurrection and all that. Wow. Yeah. Nice. It's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It is. It is quite powerful. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, Amazing. I mean, you've other things you've done. Obviously, you've, you, you only as I said you only did twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only fools and horses. <laughs> oh a, yes, only another fools. big part. For yes, you. yes. I I I left um, um, for your eyes only. I went up to 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 Edinburgh to do a play, and I came down and. Uh, uh, my agent rang me up and said, can you go and see a, a chap in the BBC to do a, a thing called Only Fools and Horses? It hadn't been transmitted yet, so I didn't ah, know right. what it you was. Didn't know, yeah. It was the very, very first series. Yeah. And uh, I went to see the, the director and he said to me, where do you live, John? I said, um, in Dulwich. He said, oh, that's next to Peckham, isn't it? I said, yes. He said, well, you can do the South East London accent, can't you? I said, yeah, 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 I can. Great. <laughs> didn't hear anything for about a month. Then all of a sudden the phone rang and said, John, you've got the part. Oh. And so... There we are. So I did Only Fools and Horses, and I, it was an extraordinary experience because I had a maverick guitarist who was playing the tune, and I said to the director, I said, I'm, I'm tone deaf and I have no voice, um, so I'll need help from the guitarist to play the melody, otherwise I won't remember old Shep at all. Well, it was fine during the rehearsal, except he started doing all the, you know, <laughs> the flamenco stuff, and I said to the director, he's doing it again. You know, and he said... He could hardly speak English, and I, I, and I could hardly speak Spanish in those days, because before I did my fight um, directing oh, courses that, yeah. in Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, another one. <laughs> but on the bloody tape with the audience, 400 audience yeah, of course. present, he started doing oh, improvisation. No. <laughs> I thought, I don't know how I got through it. I have no idea how I got through it. I can't remember what I did. It was a blind thing, panic. You get through it, don't you, somehow? You, you, you just have to, don't you? So there we are, and... Um, You've not seen it since? I haven't seen it ever. No, never seen it then? I've never seen it, because I, I, I was doing a play somewhere, I can't remember where, and that's... Yes, it was... No, I was, I, I was in New York with Ian uh, 10 years earlier. No, it wasn't. I don't know where I was, but I didn't see it, and there was no way of recording it, so I, I have never seen it. So I, I really have some, some of the Bond, the, the Bond, the uh, Only Fools and Horses fans said, you can download it, you know, yeah. you, you can... Okay. Tom, you're going to show me how to download this episode because I can't do another one. Because they kept saying, can you, um, can you sing Old Shep for us? I said, what? <laughs> the, the fans, you know. I said, I haven't, I haven't. can you do some karaoke this evening? Because there's a big karaoke session, you know, afterward for all the fans. Right, and yeah. I said, I can't sing. Well, I can't sing. And I can't remember the tune of that anyway. Do you know what it goes like, Old uh, Shep? I, I, the no. Elvis Presley song? I didn't even know it was I, an Elvis Presley song. I didn't even do it. <laughs> You've probably never seen that episode well, either. I've, I've seen clips, but uh, yeah, with you. Oh, really? But, I mean, you, you, they are available on YouTube and oh, things I must, like that. I must, yeah. get, I must get it. But, yeah. <laughs> That's no, incredible. Isn't I know, it? I know, I know. And when, when I was uh, at the Mermaid Theatre, um, I worked with a, a fight director, very famous, who'd done lots of films with uh, Errol Flynn, and he did oh, wow. all the fights. And I, he said, John, you're, you're, you know, I'd mean, learnt a little bit. Um, in drum school, he said, you're quite good. Well, I could because yeah. I could juggle and my father was very dexterous. So I was hand to eye coordination was really good. And I could remember steps because my father put me in ballet school when I was eight. Right. And I was in a, I was in a mining village in <laughs> Skegby in the Midlands. And my dad wanted us to learn the piano, to sing, to do ballet, to do tap dancing. So he we went to the local dance school in Mansfield and I learnt all that and it was so embarrassing the local press did um, end of term dancing thing yeah. uh, and, and, and the photograph of me in second position <laughs> oh, was in word. the local press I, <laughs> I went to school and they were saying hey, you're a great big <laughs> dancy boy you know, I thought I, I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. No, but it was, it, it, you know, you, in yeah. those days, a bloke in, in a tutu and not, yeah, oh, yeah, not a tutu, yeah. but leggings and or yeah. tights and doing one of those. Oh, it was so embarrassing. But anyway. You mentioned fight, the fight things, though. Oh, yeah. The fight coordinating. Coordinating. And a fight arranger. No, a, a Paddy, uh, 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 Craig said, listen, you, can you be my deputy when I'm, you know, you can take them through the routine that I've set and do all that. And I did. So the next year he was not available. So the director said, John, can you do... Can you do all the fights? And it was it was incredible because not only is there a fight in the beginning between Black Dog and uh, Black Dog and, uh, and Bones, then in the middle there is a big stockade fight with twenty pirates and then the goodies. And in that in that period, um, Spike Milligan was playing Ben Gunn, Willie Rushton was playing Squire Trelawney, 
and Barry Humphreys was playing oh. Long John Silver. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and I did all the fights. And at one point, there was this twenty pirates invading mm. the stockade where the the good blokes were there hiding, and the pirates were after the the chart where the gold was, where the treasure was. And I choreographed all this. And uh, <clears throat> at one point, um, the, the Captain Smollett, I said, "You don't take out a sword in this. You, you, you. I'm going to give you pistols, and you're going to shoot." the pirates, you know, as they come over the stockade. And these were caps, so you have to shoot and shoot, then you have to give them, they have to be reloaded, and two other ones are given to you, loaded. And Jim Hawkins, who's the young hero of yep. the place, he's loading up all the pistols and he hands them to Captain Smollett and he shoots the um, the pirates. So I, during the four weeks of rehearsals, I said to um, the, the, the actor playing Captain Smollett, I said, just say bang, you know, so rehearsal, so the actor knows that he's been shot and can fall on the floor dead. And so for, you know, for four weeks, bang, 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 you know. So come the first night, all of a sudden he got the real pistols with the real bullets, well, blanks. And blow me down if the actor didn't go bang, bang, rather than pulling the trigger. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> dear me. Oh, dear. And the, the, the pirate who was supposed to got to fall over dead, he went. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what to do. And I came off stage and I went to Captain Mark. I said, do you know what you've just done? He said, what? I said, you've said bang <laughs> rather than pulling the trigger. This is like extras, isn't it? <laughs> that that is, is something out of a comedy sketch. It is. Right? I said, yeah. what? I said, you said bang. <laughs> I said, you, you didn't pull the triggers. <laughs> <laughs> Professional oh, people. Yeah. It was wonderful. I mean, after four uh, weeks of saying bang, 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 the first night, the nerves, bang, you know, you say bang, bang, you've got... Yeah, you just don't get you. You know. Dear me. Imagine that happening on a James Bond film. Yeah. You know, you just be doing for your eyes only, and Roger Moore just goes bang. I know, <laughs> I know. But you know, th in the theatre, there's no going back. I mean, oh, terrible yeah, thing. Yeah. Wow. Terrible things happen in the theatre. I remember when I was doing, I think, I was doing this big fight as as a, a, um, a Brian. I think I was in, in that in that production. I did in the next production play Ben Gunn, but in that production, I was playing one of the pirates. And we had this huge big fight up the riggings with cutlasses and things like that. And my cutlass just snapped in half. Oh, gosh. Just snapped it because they get metal fatigued, you know, and they're used a lot. Yeah, yeah. And the half that broke, not attached to the handle, flew into the audience and hit someone across the face, the forehead, slashed over the forehead open. <sighs> oh, my word. So, I mean, you've got to be careful when you hire weapons. You don't know how often mm, they've been yeah, used yeah. to get metal fatigue and things like that. It's uh, it's very dangerous business. So you try to make sure that you don't do a swipe towards the yeah, stage. Yeah. And if you're doing a swipe, you do it upstage and not, you know. And I always, from that moment on, I always had a spare sword hidden in the set somewhere because it right, happened yeah. to me. I was doing the Scottish play in Denmark, <laughs> and my sword disintegrated. No, it wasn't my. Yes, it. It was my sword disintegrated in the fight between oh. this, uh, Macduff and yeah, himself. Yeah. I won't say the name because it's unlucky know, to say I the name. Say no. The big fight. His sword disintegrated. That's right. It just, right. It just fell apart in his mm. hands. And we have this big fight. <laughs> and I was supposed to kill him. Lucky there was an actor off stage. And I'd set all the spares there. And he came on as, for no reason at all and gave himself the sword, so we kept carry on fighting, and I, and I stuck into them. <laughs> <laughs> They're an incredible thing. When we were doing that, I was um, I, I joined a company. We went touring um, Shakespeare in all of Africa, and then the next year, all the Far East. Brilliant. Um, yeah, India, ten weeks in India, oh, wow. Korea, Singapore, and ten weeks in Japan. First night in Japan, theater, two thousand seater, did the play, took our bows. The actors went up to their dressing rooms and the dressing rooms are, are to behold in Japan. The tables are not this height with the mirrors here where the actor can put on their makeup. No, the, the tables were down there and you had to sit on the floor yes. to yeah. do the makeup. You know, anyway, Amazing. we did the play, took our bow, went upstairs, changed them out, out of our costumes and the PA system came alive and it was the floor manager saying, can John and Richard come down on stage immediately with your swords? And so... We were in our T-shirts and, and, and jeans, and we went down with our swords, which were rapiers, and I said, what's happening? He said, look, normally, after the show, the curtain comes down or it closes, and I give them five, ten minutes, and I open the curtains, and I see if they've all gone, so we can take the curtain out, and a, a, you know, a working light appears on, on, over the stage. He said, I, opened, I paged the curtains, looked out, and they were all there. None of, nobody had moved. 
And so I went out and I said to the audience, I said, the play's over, ladies and gentlemen. You, you can go home now if you wish. They said, no, we want to see the fight again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the curtains open and oh, right, me, yeah. me yeah. playing Tybalt, I played Friar Lawrence and Tybalt, we did the fight again. Oh, oh, wow, brilliant. Yeah, and it happened in Kyoto. It happened lots and lots of times. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. They wouldn't, uh, well, a lot of them wouldn't have seen anything like that before, no. would they? So, oh. No, they had yeah. never seen a Western sword fight for yeah. real. But in Kibuki and all those, they don't actually make contact. Yeah. And it's very balletic. It's mm. almost like a ballet, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, two blokes going at each other, trying to kill Whoa. each other, you know. Um, I mean, they were shocked because when Tybalt actually killed Mikusho, yeah. Under his arm, when you know he's being held back by the two other actors saying, No, stop, stop, stop. Yeah, and he's, he's being held back, and his sword's here. And Tybalt sees the opportunity, comes out, and he just stabs him. And the Japanese <laughs> were horrified, they wow. thought it was such a cowardly thing to do. Yeah, to, mm. he couldn't defend himself, he saw it coming, he couldn't defend himself. And they, they were almost hissed and booed. Yeah, him. in that culture, yeah, yes, That's so, so yeah. dishonorable to yeah, actually stab a a victim that couldn't actually defend yeah. himself, you know. <laughs> but it, it, happened, it happened so often in, in Japan, they, they, they just wanted to see the fights again. They loved yeah, the fight. Yeah, they did, didn't they? And we did. We, I went to the University of Tokyo to do some demonstrations on, on sword fighting, you know, um, how to punch someone, how to slap someone, how to kick them in mm. the uh, private right. parts and not hurt them. Yeah. When I was teaching in, in the drama schools in... Um, yeah, I choreographed fights in Madrid, Austria, and in Japan. But I was teaching in Seville, in Spain, a stage, um, a stage fighting um, in the drum school. And I was teaching how to kick someone in the private parts without hurting them. <laughs> and making full contact. Making actual oh, full really? contact. Oh. Yeah, full contact. Oh, wow. And I told them what to do and what the recipient should do and, how the, the, and the position of the kick, how it should yeah. be. The knees must be straight. And uh, so I said, well, do it to me first. I told the, the actors, the boys, and the boys were really, really, really reluctant to do the kick. Yeah. But then I said, OK, with all that, now you, the actresses, all these beautiful Spanish actresses, students, came up and they really whacked me. Oh, no. They didn't hesitate. Oh, no. And I thought, isn't it extraordinary? I said, you girls really do want to kick yeah, someone yeah, yeah. there, but yes. the boys are reluctant to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> I think because the boys know what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, it's awful, isn't it? <laughs> Speaking of, uh, you're saying <laughs> cowardice of somebody uh, taking someone when they're unarmed. Going back to the part of Luigi, and obviously Locke, is it, we presume it's Locke who kills you in yeah. the car. I don't know. Because it's what not, we it's see... It's not stated, is it? You it's said, not stated, you? and we weren't sure, because we thought initially it was the character Klaus played by Charles Dance, but then there's an extra scene that's deleted scene that he is one of the characters who gets beaten by Bond in the ice hockey scene. But obviously, we were talking about the death of Luigi as well. And it's quite brutal, especially on, like, Blu-ray now. Yeah, you can the see PG. the blood flowing from the neck and all this. And, and because you've said he's a bureaucrat and stuff, I, I suppose you've answered the question saying you're not sure, but would you imagine that it would have been Locke who did no. it? No. I would imagine it was an assassin hired by Locke. Yes. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. That's how I imagine. I think Locke is the kind of character that probably wouldn't dirty his hands. I would think. But why mm. they picked on Luigi, I have no idea. I mean, it was a big mistake because it, uh, well, it brought the ire out of uh, Roger, out of uh, and that famous scene. Yeah. I mean, that is. It's it's probably one of those most remembered dramatic scenes, isn't it, in the whole in his whole seven films? Oh, you mean the the kicking the yeah, car yeah. over the edge? And I know he wasn't keen on. So doing I've it, been wasn't told. It? Yeah. But it's so effective, isn't it? It is. It is. It is effective. Yeah. And Michael, the actor who plays mm. Locke. Yeah, Michael Gothard, yeah. He, di he died quite He did, didn't he? Did, yeah. Because yeah. I went and had a, I, I was invited to have a meal in his house and his lovely wife. And <sighs> yeah, it, it, it's shocking when you, uh, when you, some of your friends go. It's... Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm a member of Equity and I'm, I'm the, the Equity Fight Register as well. But you, know, you get these a annual obituary yeah, reports yeah. on people who are no longer with us and it's it is it's deeply sad really, it is yeah. isn't it that we're all mortal yeah yeah and i'm yeah. getting nearer to it all the time you've got a whole you're you're at the beginning of the race i'm well, on the last furlong <laughs> we've got all these amazing stories yeah man. that's what i mean john what a life but that 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 scene like we, we keep saying that roger was such a good actor as well as a, a comedian i think he was you know because um 
people and take the mickey out of the eyebrows and you can't do it. Listen, it's very difficult. It very is. difficult to do that part. Really yeah. is. I mean, any kind of part that is not, there's no great depth mm. written in the dialogue, you know, it's difficult to play. Yeah. To play ruthless and charm and gentlemanly all at the same time. Um, some of the actors can do the ruthlessness and the other people can do the charm. That's very true. But to get the, all the three yeah. together. And um, it's funny, it's very strange about talking about Ian Fleming. I was in Ockfelden, where my, my mother comes from, just outside Strasbourg, and there was um, an exhibition and um, in the local synagogue, for some reason, a historical. And there were all exhibitions of all the memorabilia that had been brought over by secret British agents mm. that had been parachuted into occupied France and all the stuff that was captured by the Germans and put on exhibition. It was all there. And there were books written by Ian Fleming oh. in that collection. Wow. There you go. I said, I don't believe it. And I went to the exhibition. I saw the deck, all the things and all the bits and pieces that, that, that Fleming had obviously written about. And, and there was a book on, on the process of how, you know, if you land and what you do with the deck and how you approach them. Mm. In the museum. That's in fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I think Fury Eyes Only was, John Glenn wanted to get it back to the Fleming a bit, didn't he? It's a bit I think more so. ruthless, isn't it? And yeah. Realistic. I suppose it was after Moonraker, of course. Yes. So, I, I, I don't know. Um, well, you've spoken to John Glenn. I, we, you know, we have spoken oh, to him, yeah. He has views about, I suppose, about what it's like now and what it's like then. And <coughs> the combination of that, because he obviously Ian Fleming was a gentleman. Yeah. Um, and he just thought he would. that's what he'd be. He'd be mm. a gentleman with a, a wonderful English sense of humour. He was what Ian Fleming wished he was, wasn't he, really? Yeah, I think and, uh, otherwise it's, it's Mission Impossible. Yeah. And I don't think it should be. What's your opinion on the latest stuff? Have, have you seen a few of the latest stuff? I have, films? I have. I've seen yeah. all, all oh, of great, them. Yeah. Because they come through BAFTA. And it's, you know, sure, yeah, yeah. BAFTA's a, but, um, and they've, ta they've taken a different path. I mean, mm. it's not up to me to judge, but no. it, it, the actor themselves decided that he wanted to make the dark side more prominent and less humour. It's up to you. You're the fans. The no, I'll not. Well, I mean, he's a wonderful... I mean, the, the actor... Yeah. He's a wonderful actor. I've mm. seen him do lots of other parts long before he became... A, yeah, a of course. Yeah, yeah. Daniel is a wonderful actor. I mean, he's a really serious actor and a humour. He can do all of it. So his uh, view of... With the, I suppose with Barbara and the directors, they, they took a line on, on what mm. they wanted 007 to be. I mean, you know... They're quite different bonds, though, aren't they? Oh, but then, but then as I say, Roger can... Well, Daniel can do the humour and Roger can do the, the hard side, yeah. but it's just not as prevalent, I suppose. Yes, I, I, yeah, I mean, whether, in retrospect, Daniel thinks that maybe the humour should be more prominent, mm. but maybe... Mm. I don't know. Because there's so many, so many um, films now, I've got all those stunts, so yeah. you've got to bring something else. You can't Absolutely. just still have bomb with something. You've got to have scenes mm. and humour and, and, and that charm. Yes, charm, you know, yeah. what, what, what Daniel brings to it, it brings a great humanity to the part yeah. as well. Yes. You know, um, whether the, you think they should be a huge backstory to the character of 07 or not is debatable. I don't know. Well, they've, d they've done it, haven't they? And it's they've a different it way of doing it. And there'll be a different way of doing it next, which will be interesting. And yeah, maybe Rogers, they cast... it might be more like Roger did it. But it's know. interesting because For Your Eyes Only is probably the biggest character study that Roger did because it starts yeah. with it starts with the first scene is him attending his wife's grave yeah and then there's this whole thing about revenge all the way through because obviously the revenge for the death of yourself of uh, Luigi and um, then he's teaching Melina all the way through to not um, avenge her parents by killing Christatos mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. so there is this character study that Roger goes through in that but it's never at the expense of the story there's a, there's always a um yeah, central thread. Isn't it's it, a though? central thread throughout it. And and my observation with the later ones is, is that there is a real focus on the character of Bond, but not necessarily a focus on the story. So I couldn't tell you what the villain's motivation was in the previous film. Do you know, it's very strange about that, how important a villain is yeah. mm. to a Bond. The great Bond films had good villains as well, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did, yeah. yeah. Very important. Mm. You get a good villain and it helps. It helps the the, yeah. the the central character. You get a weak villain and he's got nothing to play against. 
you know, they you need to, that. Yeah, need that they had black Blofeld and white. And the new villain, yeah. Suffin, didn't it, they? Yeah, yeah I, I always, I always, my own reservation about the latest one is that the villain is not, you see too much of him. I like the idea that you don't see him at all. Yeah, yeah like the original Blofeld. Yeah, you just see yeah, his hands yeah. and maybe yeah. his voice and you don't see much, the back of his Got head. Got to know as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting about not seeing what, if you lay, let the audience imagine yeah, what he's yeah. capable of. Absolutely. I remember in, as, as, a, as a very young actor in the, my very first rep job, I was doing a character who was working class window cleaner and he was being interviewed. And uh, I, I've got a cap on, a bit like the one I've got down there, wherever <laughs> it is. Over there. Get your props. I've got the, ca yeah. I've got the cap on. You get me props. There I got the cap on and it was, a, it was a mock television studio and he was being interviewed and the, and the, the interviewer had his back to the audience and he's got his mic and I was facing the audience and I got my cap on like that and I answered all the questions like that, you know, <laughs> never took my cap on. And the director says, John, we can't see your face. I said, I know. I said, this will work with yeah. the dialogue. If you see my face, it won't work because all of a sudden they can imagine what I look like. You, you yeah, do that yeah. and all of a sudden it's a different character and it's mm. it's so important you yeah. get, get that let them work a bit let yes, the audience yes, work yeah. a bit because yeah. they're good at it Trust this, the audience. Is, this is really good the imagination yeah, yeah I, I love that it, it is it's so important and yet you know people the trouble is you know like for example do you need to see a car accident with people flying through the air and all the blood everywhere or do you let the audience visualise yeah. what happened that's why it's more effective with your death. Yeah, the, absolutely. He comes back and the music, there's just a little musical cue and it's like the look on his face yeah. and then just to see you like pour yeah. out of the car yeah. and you're like, oh, good grief, little Luigi, poor Luigi. I know. In that scene there, it was about minus 30. We were so oh, cold. Was it was, it? It, I had five pairs of gloves on when they took, just to put the thing in my hand. I, I, after the cut, put the gloves on straight away. It was so cold. And of course, in the Lotus, it's so low. Yeah. When he opened the door, if I'd have fallen out, I, I wouldn't have been able to fall out. Yeah, because you're right I, there. Yeah. I wouldn't. I had to catapult with my legs, catapult myself out into that position. Just toppling <laughs> out like that, because there were, you know... Yeah, yeah you to really, the trade. Yeah. Really wow. work hard to get out that and, and fall out of that car. <laughs> really work hard. Oh, it but you didn't film. you didn't film the death, did you? Oh, the like, killing? Yeah, it no. wasn't filmed, no. No, that was never in... Because no, we never... know with Thomas Wheatley, they filmed that, didn't they? With Saunders' death. Oh, right, yeah. But they, I think they had his body dismembered. But they thought, no. I think John Glenn thought, no, we don't need to see that. You don't need to see The it. audience, is, no, you the horrific it. bit is knowing he's dead. You don't need to see yeah. it. Yeah. And it's like the VJ one in Octopussy where yeah, they yeah. say... You know, they said he was alive when we found him, and, and it, it brings an image. You know, you don't oh, see yeah, that, yeah. but it brings an image in the audience's yeah. head about yeah, the, what the, this could happen. Yes, yeah, the, the trouble with modern directors, they, 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 put, they dot the I's. Yes. They leave nothing to the audience to do. Mm. That's why quite often they don't get involved, because everything is there for them. Yeah. I remember a director said to me once when I was in a play at The Mermaid called Galileo Galilei about, about yeah. the great astronomer, <laughs> yeah. you know, and... Um, I was playing the little monk and he has a traumatic experience where in the dialogue he actually breaks down. And uh, the director said, don't get emotional, John. Don't get emotional because if you cry, the audience won't cry. Just tell, yes, them, yeah, just yeah. tell them the facts. Let them do the work. They will, they will do it for you. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Don't, don't, <clears throat> don't, don't do it for yeah. them. Let them do it. It's that. It is that show. Don't tell, as we keep yeah. keep saying. And oh, gosh, it's it's these little nuggets of, of, oh. of, of information. But even, even like Roger's face when he's got Locke on the edge of the cliff, it's not a, lo a lot of. He's like, oh, you just kill my. Friend. If he'd done that, oh no, it wouldn't have worked, would it? No. No. It's just that cut. You can tell he looks so angry. And I think he did feel sorry for you that you were caught up amongst all this. I think so. This. Yeah. This is, unfortunately, because the six scenes have been yes, cut, yeah. you didn't see that, that build-up of the relationship. Yeah. You know, all of a yeah. sudden, you, you know, it, there was a meeting at the, the top. We had the little blue vine by, this, by the ice ring. Yeah. And then I was dead. So that we'd had six scenes to get yeah. a, a real good relationship. Then it would have made sense for him to be so uh, angry yeah. and vengeful. Because John Glenn, he liked the sacrificial lamb character. 
in all these films, there's this yeah. poor ally who is here to help Bond and he it's, ends up dead. It's yeah. always very good, that. Yeah, well, it works. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea. It's, yeah. not a, it's not a bad idea to use that, that, that mechanism. <laughs> he, he, I've got to be honest, when he told us about the sacrificial army, yeah, he's in it with such satisfaction. <laughs> Make likeable characters just to kill them just off. Just to kill them, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it happens. In, in, I mean, Shakespeare was very good at all yeah. that. Yeah. Some, of, some of them, made, like Tybalt, is a wonderful character. Yeah. But has them killed off almost immediately. Oh dear! No, quite early. Because well, while I was playing Tybalt and Fry Lawrence, you could do the two. You could you could yes, play because yeah. one is dead before the first mm. appearance. When we were, we're in Africa, and I Tybalt <laughs> get killed <laughs> lying on the floor, middle of the jungle, middle of nowhere, lying on the floor dead. And I was got my eyes. I was my back to the audience, lying down with my front backstage, and the actors, two actors, talking, the, finishing the scene. And I looked across on the floor. And there was this ginormous spider walking towards me across oh, the floor. Oh. And I was lying down dead. And it was getting closer. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> word. I, was getting close. I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm not going to let that thing come and walk all over me. I thought, I'm going to play Lazarus and just get up and walk yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lucky the actors were acting. They saw it. And they just <laughs> st- Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> they stomped on it. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> oh, there, there, there's some yeah, I mean, there's, theater. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. No, you no. you come across wonderful moments like that. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. I, one thing I wanted to ask you is the accents you you adopted. Mm. You were saying you were told maybe it was a bit too much to start. With. <laughs> yeah, the original soundtrack was yeah. just as a guide track, really, and then you go po- you post yeah. sync um, months later. Is that a pine with them? Yes, it was a pine yeah, yeah. in the sound studio, and they said uh, we've got some. I don't know, it was John or John or maybe it was Cubby. It said, can you just f- lighten the actress a bit more? Just it was just too heavy, and so I just had to do what the accent do you mm. now see and hear is a, a slightly. So what, can you just give us a bit of a rendition of what it used oh, to be I like? Oh, I can't. I mean, uh, uh, the snow is a. Uh, the snow in it's better. Athens <laughs> Baroque. <laughs> Wasn't as bad as that. But yeah. I mean, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think a As you would say, I say put an extra syllable on the end of the, yeah. of the, of the word, don't they? It maybe makes him a bit too jovial, doesn't it? Then? I, I think they were worried about people not understanding. Oh, right, wow. okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that was the main concern. We've got to be understand you. Got, yeah. to, got, got to understand you. Of course, they always speak quite good English, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But it's got to be quite light because, you know. Yeah, I mean it's so good what you did because it's left such a legacy. Yeah, and you know, um, I'm 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 really humble when you see things like that. No, it's, it's true though. It God. is. It is. You know, we're, we're, <clears throat> these these are films that we have grown up with, and they are our they're our go-to films. They're our comfort blankets. Yeah, these are. are these are like our favorite films ever. And we're going to you know, we're going to be going to the Prince Charles in a bit. I know. And you're going to have hundreds of fans in yeah. exactly the same boat who micro characters of films they're obsessed with. And, yeah. and and they'll be hearing these stories about yourself and just thinking what an amazing franchise. But what how amazing it is is that so many people involved in this series was it 40 plus years on have got so many fond memories that there's a yeah. family still there that you know you've got friends from from that set and just thank you so much for your time to share this because it's just so heartwarming for us to hear. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, thank you for. I've never done this before, so it's um, it's extraordinary experience. And you've all been. Are we coming to the end now? Is that I think well. I, I, I think it's that time, maybe. It, yes, but it, it well, might be the time. That's yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. We I won't t- cut your scenes, uh, though. Oh, I know. I no. mean, no. I'll tell you one story, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, when I yeah. when when I was in the army and I went to um, um, to do my basic training, mm. there was a, an Alsatian, Alsatian of people yeah. from Strasbourg. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not not the not dog. Not the dog. The <laughs> captain of the training camp. Um, he was an Alsatian. He's called Captain Schmidt. Mm. It's a typical Alsatian, yeah. a Strasbourgian name. And he called me in and he said, uh, English, I am not going to give you a rifle to fire during your training. No weapons at all. I will never forgive you for Joan of Arc. <laughs> Joan of Arc. We're going back a bit, aren't we? <laughs> I said, what? Jean d'Arc, he said. Yeah. Oublie pas, Jean d'Arc. <laughs> wow. 
wow. <laughs> it's a wonderful story, isn't it? So yeah, I, yeah. I, I never got any basic training. So when I went back it, to the captain, and I yeah. said, I, they wouldn't let me use a rifle. He said, don't worry. We go on training all the time. We'll, 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 we'll go on a, on a rifle range. We'll teach you how to do it. Joan of Arc. <laughs> <laughs> God, people hang on to things, That's don't bit, they? Got a bit of that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. It is. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, little things like that, you, you just don't forget, do you? No, no, not at all. What a life, John. What a, a life. An amazing set of stories. But thank you very much, John, for joining thank us. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Yeah. My pleasure. It's, it's, been... a, it's a great pleasure for me. I've, uh, yeah. It's, I've never done it before, and I'm, <laughs> I hope we can do it again. I hope I'll be able to come and see you in Manchester one oh, day. Oh, yeah, please, definitely. Please yeah. come down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. lovely. We'll love meet see some of your friends and have a chat. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I haven't, God, I haven't been there since I, as I said, just worked with Ian McCullough uh, yeah. in the Actors Company. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you so thank much, you. John. Yeah, very much, John. Very much, and the cameraman. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be like cut. That. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear loads of our other episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and our YouTube channel where we have interviews, special episodes, and reviews of all the Bond films. Simply search Really 007 Pod, and you should find loads of weird and wonderful content. Remember, you're only president for life. <laughs> <laughs>